In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The world we live in is strange and getting stranger. Several weeks ago, I was watching Wheel of Fortune, and a woman introduced herself as someone who uses a lot of profanity. She has also been married for 40 years, but the first thing she wanted America to know about her was that she swears a lot. Recently, I've had some interactions with the state's franchise tax board over some tax forms for my business that they've not been able to locate. When I called, the phone representative told me to provide evidence that I had been to the doctor during the time when the forms were supposed to be mailed in, and a waiver would automatically be granted. Never mind that I had, in fact, mailed the forms on time and already provided proof of that. This past August, a 90-year-old man was arrested and charged with attempted murder and domestic violence against his 82-year-old wife. The couple lived in Encinitas. In July, a three-year-old shot his one-year-old sibling in the head. That happened in Fallbrook. On October the 1st, an 18-year-old was found beaten to death, and that was in Vista. These tragedies happened here in North County, so they seem more tragic to us. And if I told you about the 59-year-old man in El Cajon who was murdered in September, that would probably seem tragic too. But what about the unidentified person murdered at the Mexican border on July 28th? Or the 25-year-old shot in Spring Valley on July the 4th? That was probably a gang member. Another gang member was arrested and charged in that. I've been paying attention to these kind of statistics for a while, but this seems like a lot to me. And all of this is just since June of this year. And this is not Los Angeles or Chicago. In fact, not one of these acts of violence occurred in the city of San Diego. These things happened in the suburbs and here in North County. Now, I don't tell you these things to scare you, although they are scary. Indeed, today's Old Testament reading is scary enough on its own. I tell you these things because this increasing problem really has only one lasting solution. The solution is not education or money or social workers or more police. Those things may help, but they are not the solution. The weird world around us tells us clearly that crime is a race problem or a sociological problem or an education problem or a mental health problem or all of the above, but the weird world won't tell the truth. And into this weird world, God has placed us, St. Michael's by the sea. Crime is, at base, a spiritual problem, and we, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we have the solution. Our gospel reading today is pretty straightforward, and we'll get to it shortly. And our lesson and epistle are disturbingly straightforward also. They are concerned about the day of the Lord. That's the term the writers used. It's also been called Judgment Day or the End of the World and other very serious terms. Our Old Testament reading from Zephaniah sounds particularly serious, don't you think? Zephaniah was writing in the late 7th century before Christ, about 100 years after the northern kingdom of Israel had fallen to the Assyrians, and he has lots of warnings to the southern kingdom of Judah which we know fell to the Babylonians about 50 years later. Listen again to verses 17 and 18 from today's reading. I will bring distress on men so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealous wrath, all the earth shall be consumed. For a full, yea, sudden end, he will make all the inhabitants of the earth. See why it's called the end of the world? The lectionary tries to soften the blow of Zephaniah's prophecy by thrusting Moses upon us. Psalm 90 is the only psalm in the Bible attributed to Moses. Moses speaks of the end also, but much more pleasantly. Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth, or the land or the earth were born, from age to age you are God. You turn us back to the dust and say, Go back, O child of earth. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. 
In our epistle, St. Paul also speaks of last things. His letter to the church at Thessalonica also speaks of the end and of judgment. But he encourages those Christians to be ready, to be sober, to put on the breastplate of hope and the helmet of the hope of salvation. He reminds us, that church, that the Lord Jesus Christ died for us so that whether we wake or sleep, we might live with him. And this brings us to our gospel, much easier to understand than we want it to be. On the face of it, we might think that this is a parable about stewardship, which it is, but it is also a parable about the end. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. The master says that twice to each of the productive servants. Each of these servants has doubled the master's money. But it is the third servant that is most troubling, isn't it? This servant knows his master. He says he is, quote, a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not winnow. Yet he buries what the master gives him. He doesn't use it at all. He doesn't even put it in the bank where it can accumulate interest. The servant says he does this out of fear. To me, it's just stupid. But to the master, it is wicked and slothful. He orders that the one talent be taken from this servant and given to the one who has ten. To add injury to insult, he orders the worthless servant to be sent into outer darkness. Indeed, this master sounds very unfair. He says to everyone, to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Sounds like our politicians, doesn't it? The rich get richer and the poor get nothing. And this all seems pretty straightforward, right? Use what God has given you, your ability, your money, indeed all that you are and all that you have, use it for God, to honor him, to serve him, to be in union with him, the bride of Christ with Jesus, the bridegroom. Roman Catholic Bishop Robert Barron suggests that we not miss one of the nuances of this parable. He writes, What the contemporary reader will likely miss, and what the ancient Jewish reader would have caught immediately, is the connection to heaviness. A talent was weighty, and five talents was massively heavy. Heaviness would have brought to mind the heaviest weight of all, which was the kabod of Yahweh. That term was rendered in Greek as doxa and in Latin as gloria, both of which carry the connotation of luminosity, but the basic sense of the Hebrew word is heaviness or gravitas. Therefore, says the bishop, the problem with the timid servant who buried his talent is not that he was an ineffective venture capitalist, but that he fundamentally misunderstood the nature of what he had been given. How often this is true of you and me, right? We misunderstand what God has done for us. We under misunderstand who God is. And rather than serve him with what he's given us, we serve our own appetites. In the sixth century, St. Gregory writes these words of warning regarding the third servant. To hide one's talent in the earth is to devote the ability we have received to worldly business. The servant would not trade with his talents returns to his Lord with words of excuse. We all, all of us here at St. Michael's who love God, we all must examine ourselves thinking carefully about how we are using what God has given us. I am probably the wrong person to be talking about tithing. My parents drilled tithing into me like brushing my teeth and wearing my seatbelt. My first allowance was a dime. My parents gave it to me on Saturday, and on Sunday morning, a penny went into the plate at church. When I was 22, I inherited a significant amount of money from my grandmother's estate. Without anyone's input, I wrote a check for 10% of that inheritance to my church. As an adult, with rent and bills and a car payment, I had to think through this discipline, for that's what this is, a spiritual discipline. But if I had any doubts, they all faded away in the early 90s when I met a man named Jack Ridge in Finley, Ohio. Mr. Ridge had, 20 years before, founded a civil engineering company that gives 50%, not the tithe of 10%,
but 50% of its profits to Christian causes, mostly overseas missionaries. He sold the company, and it's since been sold again, but each of the owners has insisted that this policy continue. And, by the way, they've never been short on business. In the mid-1980s, Mr. Ridge told me, he founded TLB Incorporated, which stands for The Lord's Business. When the company was new, Mr. Ridge said he could not afford to tithe, but he promised God that every raise he was able to give himself, he would give the entire raise to Christian causes. He told me that on his 1040 the next April, his donations were exactly 10% of his income. TLB's product was the Solomon Series software, which Mr. Ridge sold to Microsoft in 1999 for $142 million. Besides tithing, my mother also taught me about serving the Lord. She used to say, if you don't use your talents and abilities to serve God, you'll lose them. And I also saw this little aphorism played out in the early 90s. My friend Ernie had become a Christian, and his job was a one-man band entertainer in hotel bars. He was what we used to call a lounge lizard. He did happy hours at the local Holiday Inn and sometimes got a, a, a local gig, a longer gig, at a bar. But after he became a Christian, it was clear God had other plans for Ernie. He was a great musician, but he began to lose his singing voice. I would often show up for Ernie's happy hour gigs just to talk to him between songs. One evening, he sang Elton John's song, Daniel, and it was so bad that it left even me speechless. Ernie quit the music business shortly after that. And so here we are, you and I, my brothers and sisters of St. Michael's. We are the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, and God has placed us here and now to be a beacon of God's truth and love, and we are that beacon by sharing Christ's work of reconciliation and healing in the world. In the world, on the beach, in the suburbs, Christ is, in fact, the answer to the world's problems. And, that, and the means he uses to answer these problems is us, his church, his bride, his body. That's you. That's me. I mentioned Bishop Barron and the weight of the talents earlier. But let us not forget the weightiest thing that God has given us. That weighty thing is himself. God gives himself to us. He unites himself to us first in baptism, then in Holy Communion. St. Bernard of Clairvaux writes this in the 12th century. What therefore shall I render to the Lord for all that he has done for me? By creating, he gave me to myself but he restored me to myself when he gave himself to me, first given and then restored. I doubly owe myself to him, but what do I owe to God for the gift of himself? If I gave him my whole being a thousand times over, what would that be in comparison of God? Perhaps thinking of that third servant in our parable, St. Bernard writes, It is impossible, poor slaves, to toil for this world's riches and also to glory in the cross of our Savior Jesus Christ, at the same time to desire and label for earthly things and to taste the sweetness of our Lord. Here again is St. Gregory talking about the third servant in our gospel. But there are many within the church of whom this servant is a type, who fear to set out on the path of a better life, and yet are not afraid to continue in carnal indolence. They esteem themselves sinners and therefore tremble to take up the paths of holiness, but fearlessly remain in their own iniquities. May such an accusation never be made of us. Let us remember the weighty salvation that Christ purchased for us on the cross, and let that weight move us, drive us, and compel us to be generous, to be faithful, and to serve God, our neighbor, and our enemies. And maybe such motivations will bring about safer neighborhoods, if only a little bit. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.